started. Martin and Stephen are going to talk to us about administering a system for smart people. And that, I'm not sure that includes us. Um, okay, we've got this, um, this machine called auslabs.org. Um, Stephen's the main sys admin for it. And it's a shared hosting machine amongst a bunch of the Auslabs crowd. Um, so we host a bunch of web servers, a bunch of Git repositories, and a bunch of potentially other interesting things. Um, so we've got this machine. It runs Debian testing. Uh, there are about 100 domains hosted on it. And um, it's one of those Raspberry Pis. No. <laughs> Uh, most of the domains are used for web serving um, or email. And yeah, there's that grab bag of other stuff that you find on uh, servers. So what's the big deal? Why am I standing up in front of 57 people? Why is Stephen here? Well, all of our users are free software hackers and they all know their way around a shell and somewhere or other they all administer their own system and on this particular box all of them can get a root shell pretty much there might be one or two that we don't trust but uh <coughs> and you know all the admin is done via interactive shell like um like all of you right so what's our goal here we want to minimize the potential damage you know that, that's the usual sysadmin goal right any time you delegate responsibility, delegating is good because it saves you work. So the last talk spoke about delegation and the real reason why we're standing here is because we've delegated a lot of stuff and we just don't want to um, do everything. When somebody says, I want to add a domain and I want there to be a web server and other stuff, we're just sitting there, you know, playing, what's that game? No, well, Angry Birds will do, you know. It's better than doing sysadmin. You, me? Is this on? Yeah, good. Okay, so the, the principle was we just wanted to have as simple a machine as we could. We didn't want to invent anything new because we're not that bright anymore. Um, so everybody knows about etc. so we thought we would just duplicate that infrastructure in people's home directories and uh, work with that because everybody knows how to do that. Um, from most of the things you want to run you can either include files or you can just symlink things into directories where they'll get used by the system whatever system processes you want and wherever we can we, we restrict sudo we, we allow certain operations to be done with a restricted sudo so that you people don't accidentally do things. Um, I think only once we've had somebody type sudo reboot. Luckily their password on the machine they were trying to reboot was different to their password on our machine. <coughs> we found out. Um, we do allow unrestricted sudo to everybody, almost everybody on the machine, um, but we don't like people using it if we can. Um, we've recently set up a second machine on a virtualized machine in the US where nobody has root except me and Martin, so we're seeing how well that works. May uh, implement that back here. <laughs> but if it starts creating work, yeah, we don't want to work. No. <laughs> so, okay. So here is my etc. or Etsy directory, depending upon where you come from. It's not very interesting, right? It just looks like a subset of what you'd find in Debian or Red Hat or Fedora or whatever. Um, so I run a stack of stuff and. I administer nearly all of it from my home directory because although I can be root, I don't want to be. So the other thing that happens is that um, then when I set something up at home I go, hmm, I don't really want to administer this as root because I can't be trusted. So I do this sort of setup again. Um, if I set up a web server at home, even though it's pretty unimportant, um, I use this sort of structure and do the same sort of things we're doing here. Uh, bind turns out to be uh, pretty simple because bind has include files. So for each user we just we said oh yeah, okay. So for each user we just include a namedy.conf fragment from their home directory. Um, there's no special permissions required. 
They can edit it, they can put whatever domains in there they want to, they can really screw us over if they really try. Nobody's done that yet. Um, so you can see the example configuration looks like any other configuration. And because we put everybody into the bind group in Debian, um, the RNDC key is, in, is accessible to anybody in the bind group, so people can reload the, the name server, do anything they want like that without, any, without actually needing root. This is a good thing. Um, and so consequently, as Martin said, we've got like 100 plus domains all set up being served from this one machine and people take care of their own. And they never bother Stephen. So you're sitting here going, what? So, so this, is, this is all meant to be completely unsurprising. Um, and I'm glad that it is. By the way, there are other good talks going on in adjacent theatres. Feel free. Okay, we use uh, Postfix for handling Incoming email, um, virtuals. Um, every, everyone who has domains, um, you know, I've got several because I'm a collector. And uh, everyone administers their own virtual file, which is done, or the, their own um, virtual alias maps. So everyone's got one of these include ish lines in the postfix config up the top there. And then it just looks like any old virtual file. Completely unsurprising again, and, and when you change the file, you just run this map, and you don't need to be root. You don't need to edit any system files. And um, yet again, completely unsurprising. Um, Apache is much the same, except in Debian, um, there's the sites available directory just has a symlink in there for every site you want to do. So we just symlink people's, from people's home directories in there. Um, we have a restricted sudo so that anybody can re, 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 uh, reset the, the Apache um, when they make changes to their config or add new domains or remove them, which almost never happens. Um, and the only other thing we have is that we use SNI so people can actually have their own secure, H well they have an HTTPS server if they want to, um, which works with most people's browsers except some well-known Microsoft ones. <laughs> And yeah, perhaps we should change to running the, the init script because it, it actually does a config test instead of uh, just trying to reload it and p potentially breaking something. But you know. Graceful tests. Graceful tests? Graceful yeah. Oh, cool. And it won't, take, it won't take the server down? Yeah, okay. Right. See, There's some edge cases, but they're pretty yeah. secure. See, this is the stuff that we never need to know because everything just works and all our users break it and we never do. Um, so the most complex thing we've done is we, we want to, uh, so when we set this up, of course, you know, we had to provide email accounts for wives, girlfriends, um, children, dogs, and all that sort of thing. And we started, we started down the easy road of just creating a Unix account, as you do. And we do love Dovecoat, and we wanted to figure out how you could do virtual uh, domains and virtual users in there while providing uh, individual spam assassin configurations for each virtual user. And if you know a better way of doing this crazy thing than the way we've done it, you know, please uh, yell out in question time or come down and tell us because we'd love to get rid of some of this junk. But uh, you know, this is really a question and answer session where we go, we've done it this way, tell us a better way please. So we want our mail delivered from Postfix. We want per user, per virtual user spam assassin, assassin config. And we want civ configurations per virtual user so we can deliver to all the different virtual users. So the first thing to do is tell Dovecote that we want a bunch of virtual users. And the simplest way seems to be to just tell it that we've got this pass DB .d directory and symlink in the past DBs and that way we can manage our own users in our own account, not as root. Anytime we want to add one or change a password, we can, we can do that for people and um, it doesn't have to be done at the, at the system level. Once you've done that first bit of config on that slide. And then it's really hard to cat a file but to hide the password. Um, this is security by obscurity. 
I didn't want anyone to know Mel's password, even though it was hashed. Okay, so then all I need to do is have a user, I give that user a home directory, which is under home martin s var mail melton.net mel, and then Mel's mail, mail directory um, is tilde mail under there. So it's as though she's got her home directory, it's just that I own all her mail files. Um, it does let me find out what she's getting me for Christmas a little in advance, but you know, that's the way things work. You can set passwords with Dove, code, with Dove Adam PW. It seems to just print them on the screen, you can paste them in. Um, and that, that's all that needs to be done for each Dovecote virtual user to be able to read mail. The tricky part is the delivery. You need to define some virtual foo in Postfix and you need to define your virtu a virtual transport which in this case is Dovecote. In master.cf you define a way of delivering mail for the people using that transport and in this case we've got this user local sbin vmail script which actually does the delivery because we're crazy. And then, so people can have individual spam assassin configs, you do need symlinks because uh, spamd can only, if you do use spamd, which is the sensible thing to do, so it's lightweight, um, spamd can only read configs according to a particular pattern from one directory. So it's a little bit horrible. So we have symlinks from etc. spam assassin blah into um, the actual home directory. I saved myself one level of symlinks. If, you, if that doesn't make sense, just go, huh? And there's the vmail script. Isn't it beautiful? In fact, the, only the last line is important. You've got spam filtering and then you run dovecode LDA to deliver the mail and somewhere you need to strip the dot virtual. Each of our virtual domains ends in dot virtual and in here you have to strip the dot virtual off the domain and everything just works. So we can go in, tweak a virtual user's spam assassin config to say, you know, lower the threshold from five to three, uh, strengthen some of the rules and uh, just works. And if there's no history, then we just deliver the mail straight through. We just cat it. And right, so for this user, um, we just deliver their mail to the dot virtual version of the domain. And, uh, and that way I can add as many virtual users to my domains as I like without having to be root and so can all of our other users who, um, who make as many mistakes as I do. Other stuff. Um, if you don't use etc. Keeper, you should. Okay. Um, etc. Keeper normally works on slash etc. and it just puts everything in Git, which means when you make mistakes, you can go back and nobody'll ever know if you know about reset and things. Um, we do suggest the same on people's home etc. directories because again, when they make mistakes, they can find out what it was. Um, we have a single dynamic DNS zone, which is just useful for people because. A lot of people still end up on dynamic IP addresses when they, uh, when they connect to their ISP and so they can update this zone and they can have C names pointing into the zone so they can find their own machines from work and places. We should really have advertised this as a cloud talk. No. <laughs> no, you're right. No clouds. <laughs> it's raining. Okay, so we've invented as little as possible. It's all totally uninspiring. Um, the main postfix config file has been modified, was modified three times last year, um, even though we added a bunch of users and domains and made a bunch of changes. Um, the site's available directory for um, Apache got one new symlink last year, so that's, that's uh, pretty lightweight. And um, named.conf.local got modified one time in 2012 for user related changes. I think. Uh, Stephen did some IPv6 magic as well, but we won't count that. And the great thing is, none of our users have ever done anything really stupid. The only person who nearly accidentally re rebooted the box, as Stephen said, couldn't figure out why the password for the machine they were trying to reboot wouldn't work, and they went, oops, control C, and everything survived. 
And because we work for a large multinational, um, there's some legalese. And now I'll zip back to the beginning so you can see a penguin. And given that that was really inspiring, there's, there's a question. There are two questions. Molly guard. Uh, no, we don't. You but. should because the family user shared his password. After typing the correct suited password, you would have pushed enter and would have said, type in the host name of the box you wish to read. Right. Yeah. Yes. We should, we, sh we should, but it's sort of. Well, it's only ever happened once and it didn't actually happen. <laughs> <laughs> and if it had it happened, we knew who did it. <laughs> so we'll come after them. But and that was so the. Certainly, Molly guards are useful, would be useful. And that was the same question and the same point to be made. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to switch to something else. Okay. 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 Thank you.